On the Power and Impotence of Philosophy by Danilo Pajovic. Danilo Pajovic, who has translated the works of Lukács, Bloch, Heidegger, Sartre, and others into Serbo-Croatian, has also written articles about these men. His books include French Philosophy of Enlightenment, The Real World, and Why Philosophy. He was born in Ludbrig, Yugoslavia in 1928 and studied philosophy at Zagreb University, where he received his PhD in 1958. Subsequently, he spent two years studying at the University of Freiburg and in New York on a Ford Foundation Fellowship. Since 1955, he has been teaching philosophy at the University of Zagreb. Quote, philosophy and revolution is a frequent theme in our philosophical discussions, a theme not only in currency as a reminder of our celebration of the 20th anniversary of the popular uprising in Yugoslavia, but also decisive in the highest sense to the entirety of Marxism, indicating as it does the vitality of the relationship between Marx's thought and the existing world and embodying the essence of the intellectual and practical appeal of Marx's thought in modern history. Indeed, quote, philosophy and revolution is only another way of expressing Marx's well-worn catchphrase about the realization of philosophy. Beginning as a revolution in philosophy in order to end as a revolutionary philosophy in the form of the philosophy of the revolution. What is involved here is not just a revolutionary rhetorical phrase from the pen of the young Marx, or a striking stylistic effect, or an exaggerated literary metaphor that paraphrases a, com a, quote, a compound of Hegel and Feuerbach, end quote, in the eyes of those interpreters and critics who are happy to point at the, quote, mature creations of the old Marx, end quote, as leaving behind illusory youthful romanticism and revealing a, quote, definitive abandonment of philosophy in favor of politics. No, the idea of the realization of philosophy remained Marx's central thought from the moment of its original formulation in contribution to a critique of Hegel's philosophy of law through the so-called, quote, middle Marx, the political writer, all the way to the final pages of the post humus third volume of Capital, which continue, despite all, quote, real, realistic anti-philosophers, to work with such, quote, long-since-abandoned categories as, quote, alienation and, quote, realization. Incidentally, the notion of the realization of philosophy is actually the basis of Marx's renewed analysis of the, quote, fetishism of goods in the first volume of Capital, where Marx's struggle to shorten the working day and for the major components of Marx's critique of the Gotha program. Hence, what is involved here is nothing less than Marx's central idea. The entirety of the magnificent intellectual structure of Marxism stands or falls on it. Nevertheless, we should immediately recognize that the way in which this idea is formulated does change in the course of Marx's writing. For this reason, and because of the unexemplary language, Throughout the latter works, the concept is not always entirely clear, but there is no reason why our intellectual interpretation of Marx's works as a whole cannot be everywhere acknowledged as fundamental. The idea of the, quote, solemnization of philosophy, end quote, to the effect that philosophy ought to be taken seriously, and that only in this way can philosophy become capable of changing the world, is thus Marx's central idea as a thinker, clearly indicating Marx's supreme intellectual ambition to be no more nor less than Promethean. Marx had cited the image of Prometheus as, quote, the greatest in the entire philosophical roster, end quote, as early as his doctoral dissertation on the, quote, differences between the philosophies of nature, of Democritus, and Epicurus, end quote, 
seeing in him the personification of the concept of philosophy imminent in the entire history of the West. Originating as critical thought in Greece, as part of an effort to free man from fear, philosophy had been anti-mythic from the start and had introduced reason instead of miracles as the explanation of the world. The historic mission of philosophy had thus been to lead to the liberation of the world in the process of uncovering the truth about man and being as a whole. Prometheus initiated heresy in stealing fire from the gods to give it to men, that they might inhabit the earth warmed. That is why Marx saw in Prometheus the first philosopher. In other words, true philosophy could justify its existence only by keeping faith with philosophy's Promethean mission. In modern times, in Marx's opinion, philosophy had betrayed philosophy's Promethean mission and philosophy's raison d'etre by becoming an exact science of things, i.e. by being transformed into the economics of the bourgeois world. The turnabout in philosophy in modern times and the rise of the bourgeois economics of the production of goods and of the exploitation of man and nature for profit were, for Marx, the same process of the perversion of philosophy from an idea of liberation into the science of exploitation and enslavement. The prime task of philosophy, in the eyes of Marx as a thinker, was to turn itself around again, to revolutionize philosophy self, and return to philosophy's origins in the grand humanistic tradition of the ancient world. This would be possible only if the world that had transformed people into things were destroyed, that world of which the most objective alienated expression had been obtained in modern philosophy through the Hegelian scheme. Serious considerations for philosophy and the solemnization of the essence of philosophy in Marx's view, must take the form of the abolition of the real world, that in the real world's thoroughgoing alienation, transformed philosophy into unserious twaddle, and exiled philosophy to the realm of the pure thoughts of a purely intellectual imagination. The mutual alienation between unserious philosophy and the real serious world is therefore not only a philosophical problem, but indeed primarily a problem of the world. However, since Hegelian philosophy has no more than the perfected intellectual, excuse me, however, since Hegelian philosophy was no more than the perfected intellectual expression of the senselessness of the bourgeois world, the widest possible gap had opened up between philosophy as rationality and the world as senselessness. The two could be reconciled only through the realization of the sense of philosophy that had been wholly lost in the world. Marx's concept of revolution dovetails in this way with his idea about the realization of philosophy. On the other hand, in view of the fact that Marx was Hegel's disciple, the question arises as to whether the realization of philosophy may not have meant for Marx primarily the realization of Hegelian philosophy. Yes and no. Yes to the extent that Hegelian thought remains philosophy, but no to the extent that Hegelian thought is the most grandiose reflection of the loss of philosophy as a means of liberating the world. Marx's concept of the realization of philosophy, precisely to the extent that Marx's conception of the realization of philosophy is the philosophical thought of the revolution, is therefore essentially ambiguous. This essential ambiguity in Marx's message carries within it the clear possibility of a dual interpretation. The realization of philosophy takes place primarily as the realization of Hegelian philosophy, but also as something else far more concealed and hence more difficult to understand. The possibility of a dual interpretation is thus present within Marx's thought itself. Marx's thought is capable of being understood solely 
as a demand for the realization of modern philosophy as compressed into the Hegelian program, while the other aspect can be forgotten. Such has in fact been the case. This is precisely why it was possible for the realization of philosophy the, to be comprehended as no more than the fulfillment of the Hegelian demand for a thoroughgoing rationalization of the world. Yet the world has already been rationalized in the modern era in the sense of modern technology and economics. At the same time, the other aspect of Marxist thought was forgotten, i.e. the realization of the Promethean function of philosophy. On this basis, Marx also looked upon Hegel as a positivist, as an interpreter of the real world that must be eliminated in the real world's reality and returned to the free habitat of mankind. Many interpret today, excuse me, many today interpret this very idea about the changing about changing the world as an expression of Marx's dissatisfaction with Hegelian conservatism as a demand for the radicalization of Hegelianism, and as an effort to fulfill the master's program. Marx is therefore a technologist, say these interpreters, and everything that has happened to Marx's thought in the 20th century is inevitable and could not have been otherwise. The whole difficulty of understanding Marx's fundamental thought originates in his speculative ambiguity. Marx knew, knew that his idea of the realization of philosophy could not be realized apart from the fulfillment of the Hegelian program, i.e. the rationalization of the world in terms of modern technology and economics. Yet Marx by no means thought that the latter would mark the fulfillment of his own program or that the realization of philosophy as the Promethean idea of liberation would be no more than the realization of modern philosophy. Marx knew that, quote, there can be no returning to the old days, end quote, and that his vision could be realized only along with the realization of Hegelian philosophy. Yet in, in that which had been, not everything had passed away. It was contained in the essence of the future. Only in this way can we explain those frequent, quote, romantic digressions in Marx's writings in which he expresses admiration for the medieval craftsman as an artist in contrast to the mechanized modern worker, dismembered as a personality and transfigured into a piece of machinery by the division of labor. This ambiguity in relation to the realization of philosophy makes it possible to regard Marx solely as a technologist. And this remains one possibility of interpretation. Marx was understood in this fashion by social democracy, which first broke up the whole of his thought into, quote, purely scientific and, quote, ideological, ethical components. Marx's thought was then dissolved into a, quote, objective scientific pattern, comprehended after the fashion of the natural sciences, and complemented by a pure, quote, ethical imperative. The theory and practice that followed are a matter of record. Many contemporary interpretations of Marxism, including that of the Polish philosopher Leszek Kalakowski, Kolakowski, Still try, to, still try to separate Marx, the scholar, from Marx, the ideologist. Much more importantly, however, such, quote, reworkings have had the effect of clearing the ground for interpretations that have not simply remained in the realm of theory, but have also penetrated into the practice of politics on a grand scale. Who is the greatest interpreter of Marx in this sense? Who built on this misinterpretation a whole system of ideas as the foundation of a political practice. None other than the, quote, great genius of mankind, long too long renowned as the, quote, greatest philosopher, economist, politician, strategist, linguistic, aesthetician, etc., etc., end quote. Stalin. What does Stalinism mean in philosophical terms? 
nothing else but an interpretation of Marx's idea about the realization of philosophy in a strictly Hegelian sense, i.e. the realization of philosophy as technology, fulfilled to the maximum extent in Stalin's version of, quote, socialism in one, co socialism in one country, end quote. But we should not seek the sources of this interpretation in Stalin's, quote, philosophical writings, nor even in his political speeches, much less in the official Soviet edition of this, quote, gem, or in the political police persecution of academic philosophy. At best, the idea in such sources would provide only partial and peripheral descriptions of what Stalin accomplished in the course of his rule in the practice of the planned, quote, technification of Russia. This feat in actuality was possible only on the basis of a total or absolute organization of politics, economics, and all spheres of Soviet life generally. Everything had to be planned and calculated from a single center. Everything had to be objectified in the light of a rational arrangement of the world as a technical system. All, quote, sectors of reality were to function as the component parts of a single mechanism with the motive force and the drive fused in the person of the leader. The absolute technological organization, excuse me, absolute technological organization is feasible in practice somewhere on this earth in our times only because technology is not just the characteristic feature of present day life, but rather is in itself contemporaneity, contemporaneity in the sense of bare present day life, the current era in the world. For technology originates in the essence of the course of modern history. In this sense, Stalin, quote, had right on his side, end quote, when he demanded that everything must be sacrificed in the name of this goal, and he possessed exemplary knowledge of how to execute his policies in practice. This knowledge which broaches no disagreement, and which knows everything earlier and better than anyone else, is the only possible knowledge in an absolute organization. This is the renowned Hegelian absolute knowledge that concludes the phenomenology. This is why Stalin was everywhere and always, quote, the most this and that, the most this and that, and who no one could know more than he. Precisely all the lower forms of knowledge were only prestiges of the absolute and acquired their sanction, justification, and dignity only when the leader nodded his head, deprived his subjects of their essential nature, and deigned them a suitable place within the system of the closed circle of absolute knowledge. This is the metaphysical, speculative, dialectical secret of Stalinism. But how did Stalinism appear in empirical terms? Exactly as the opposite. As the servant of the people and of technology, Stalin was depicted in ascetic tones as the most devoted of modest clerks in the organization. In essence, however, Stalin's metaphysical image and empirical image originate in the same essential configuration. Even Stalin, in all his power, is the very picture of an implement, for the instrumentality of technology spares no man, and Stalin could thus be only the implement at the disposal of some higher element that had been built into the system of absolute organization. Having transformed all into implements and equipment, Stalin then proceeded to execute his program of industrialization and succeeded in Europeanizing Russia into a mighty technological power. He was extending the work of Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great in this sense, and became, however strange it may seem, the greatest continuer of the bourgeois world. Stalin is the philosopher of the technological revolution par excellence. 
Through Stalin's efforts, peasant Russia acquired the capacity to conquer the cosmos and to fire missiles into the heavens, once the habit of gods now dead. Why, then, is it possible and even justifiable today for Stalin's continuers to criticize Stalinism? Because Stalinism is, after all, a romantic phase of the technological revolution, and Stalinist methods are becoming a barrier to further technological advance. Criticism of Stalinism in the Soviet Union today therefore amounts primarily to a destruction of the hindrances to the further realization of philosophy as technology, for Stalinist methods have become outmoded in present-day Russia. This does not mean that such methods will cease to play a role in countries with a stage of development such as China's at the moment. Quote, Chinese communism may even outstrip Stalinism in time, drawing closer and closer to the, quote, bestial form that Marx saw before him in the possibility of such a realization of philosophy. This is a quote from Marx. Communism is, after all, the positive expression of abolished private property is first and foremost general private ownership by virtue of the fact that this relation is comprehended in its generality. Communism in its primary form only the generalization and extension of such ownership. In this way communism manifests itself in a dual form. The authority of property ownership is so strong in opposition at first that primary communism will want to liquidate everything that is not capable of being possessed by everybody as private property, to purloin talent, and so forth. Direct physical possession is the only goal of life and existence. The status of worker is not abolished, yet it just extended to cover all men. The private property relationship remains the relationship of the community with the objective world. Finally, the tendency to counterpose general private ownership to private ownership comes to be manifested in such a bestial form that the community of women is counterposed to the marital state, which is surely a form of exclusive private ownership, with women becoming social and common property. It can be said that this idea about the community of women is the proclaimed secret of such a terribly crude and unintellectual in unintellectual communism. Just as woman passes from the marital state to common prostitution, so also does the entire world of wealth, i.e. of the objective human being, pass from a relationship of exclusive marriage with a private owner to a relationship of universal prostitution with the community. Such communism, by everywhere negating the human personality, is only the consequential expression of private ownership, which latter is a negation itself. General envy, which becomes constituted as a force, is only a form of concealment in which avarice is installed and given satisfaction in a different way. The spirit of all private ownership as such is at least directed against any richer private ownership in the sense of envy and proclivity to possess to pro a process of leveling off, which latter attributes may be said to make up the essence of competition. The primitive communist is simply an extension of this envy and of his leveling off process in terms of a foreordained minimum. His horizon is specific and limited, how little this abolishment, abolishment of private ownership has to do with the genuine acquisition of property is evidenced precisely by this abstract negation of the whole world of education and civilization. Excuse me. The primitive communist is simply an extension 
of this envy and of this leveling off process in terms of foreordained minimum, its horizon is specific and limited. How little this abolition, abolishment of private ownership has to do with the genuine acquisition of property is evidenced precisely by this abstract negation of the whole world of education and civilization, by this return to the unnatural simplicity of the man who is poverty-stricken and without needs, and who has not yet reached the stage of private ownership, much less overcome the stage of private ownership. The community is only a community of labor and equality of wages, which are paid by the joint capital, i.e. by the community as the common capitalist. Both sides in this relationship are raised up to a foreordained generality, labor as a compulsion assigned to everyone, capital as the recognized generality, and as the power of the community. End quote. Marx. Can there be a better description of the, quote, Chinese road to socialism? Yet this Chinese road to socialism is only an Asiatic form of Stalinism, an extension of Stalinism in the form of a caricature of the omnipresent total senselessness of existence. If Stalinism is thus one of the stages in the technological revolution, and one of the ways to realize philosophy in the Marxian sense as the exclusive realization of Hegelian philosophy, then its place in history has been defined at the same time, its boundaries and transience. Hence, Stalinism is not just false. Stalinism is part of the truth. The development of the productive forces as the chief task of the present creates part of the future but is not itself the future. There can be no leisure in the midst of poverty, and philosophy begins out of leisure in the sense of contemplation. The luxury of contemplation is possible, says Aristotle in his Metaphysics, when physical needs have been satisfied, and of a search after the sense of human existence in the world and in the wholeness of being. A revolution in human relations and a turnabout in man himself are therefore the goals of socialism. A revolution in human relations and a turnabout in man himself are therefore the goals of socialism. The revolution in human relations and a turnabout in man himself are therefore the goals of socialism, not the build-up of the productive forces. Sorry, the mic's facing out. A revolution in human relations and a turnabout in man himself are therefore the goals of socialism, not the build-up of the productive forces. This is exactly why Stalinism did not humanize relations in production, much less social and human relations generally. Having subordinated all to industrialization, Stalin destroyed much in this respect, if not indeed culture, in the final analysis. Though music, the most abstract of the arts, flourished during Stalin's reign, poetry and the pictorial arts did not. Stalin neither knew nor wanted to know about the Promethean aspect of the matter. Of course, course, much less deal with the Promethean aspect of the matter. But the Promethean aspect of the matter remains the essential task of democratic socialism. Political power is not needed for this job, nor can the goal ever be attained in the goal's totality, for this concealed sense of being is the truth of the world, which can be grasped only in fragments in time as a reflection of its transience. The goal of history, the full sense of history, can never be realized in its totality. The goal of history, the full sense of history, can never be realized in its totality. We can only approach it more closely. What does philosophy have to contribute to this end? 
As power, philosophy has already been realized in technology. As powerlessness, philosophy may be defined as the creative powerlessness to determine the full sense of the movement that reveals itself to a limited extent in various eras of history. In history, therefore, the world is directed towards something that surpasses it, evidencing the impotence of philosophy and the end of the world itself. Yet to realize the lost sense of the world still makes sense, for this is an approach and a conscious movement in the direction of this lost sense, so that man may be at peace with himself, feel at home, and return from an alien land to his home country and true habitat. This is a process that lasts as long as history itself, since time equals transience in motion towards the higher sense of human life on this earth that is realized only in stages. All utopias, therefore, appear to be burdened with exaggerated pretensions, originating as they do not in the Greek's Promethean understanding of the mission of philosophy, but rather in the biblical faith and salvation. Technology is thus perverted from a means of shortening the workday and increasing leisure time into an attempt to deliver us from the curse of labor, Adam's exile from paradise, leading to extremely dangerous consequences and to the negation of transience as the essence of history. But if the goal of history is understood to be not salvation, but rather a freer and more sensible life on this planet, then philosophy has the task envisaged by Marx to be sensible and not calculating and capable of helping people to live more sensibly and of leading them to freedom. If this essential other interpretation of Marx should be forgotten, in contrast to Stalinism, all is lost. Dual interpretation, as well as misinterpretation, is always a possibility with every great idea. This is why Stalinism, quote, was possible. This is why our struggle for the humanistic dimension in Marx's thought is, the greatest signif is of the greatest significance at this moment in history. Philosophy can prove nothing, but it can point the way if we are willing to listen to it. In an essential and most profound sense, therefore, Philosophy and revolution remain interrelated as two aspects of a single process that is to last as long as history itself. In the simplest terms, Marx wanted to turn man's life away from concern with things and towards greater concern with himself and with his own meaning, which had been lost in the world of labor, economics, and technology. This is the essential revolution that is supposed to take place inside us. Otherwise, the danger exists that Marx will continue to be regarded as a techno technologist and as the prophet of the technological revolution leading to mythical high living standards. This Marx did not want. If we fail to take this other side of his message about the solemnization of philosophy seriously, or if we do not hear him out to the end, or mishear, then philosophy will be devoid of any sense, and Stalin will be the greatest, modern, and sole true Marxist. Translated by William Hanaher. <laughs>